Welcome to the GOB Laboratory at Mercy University. In this experiment, we're going to separate a mixture of food dyes using a technique called chromatography. In part A of this experiment, we're going to use the technique of paper chromatography to separate and identify the components of various food colorings. Here are some of the materials that we're going to make use of in part A of this experiment. To begin, select a piece of chromatography paper and draw a baseline approximately one centimeter from the edge of the paper. Next, draw vertical folding lines approximately two and a half to three centimeters from both edges. To complete your baseline, draw five equally spaced tick marks starting from the center and working out in increments of 1.5 centimeters. These will be the positions where you will eventually apply the dyes. Next, go ahead and pre-fold the edges of your chromatography paper. It's helpful to complete these steps on a paper towel rather than directly on the lab bench because you don't want to contaminate your chromatography paper and you don't know what substances there might be on the laboratory bench. For your chromatography experiment, you've been provided with a set of 10 food dyes or mixtures. Five of these are pure dye standards labeled Red 40, Blue 2, Red 3, Blue 1, and Yellow 5. The other five are potential dye mixtures drawn from blue, green, and yellow food coloring, as well as two unknowns labeled Unknown 1 and Unknown 2. We're going to start with the five pure dye standards for our first chromatogram. To apply the dyes to your chromatogram, use a toothpick, dip it in each dye, and lightly touch the end of the toothpick to your chromatography paper to spot your baseline. You'll need to repeat this process for each of the four remaining dye standards you want to add to this particular chromatogram. Be careful not to over apply the dye to your baseline. If your spot is too big or you get too much dye, you will get a lot of smearing when your chromatogram develops. However, for some of the lighter colors like the yellows or the oranges, you may want to spot twice to make sure that you get enough dye on your chromatogram so that you can see the spot when it develops. Also make sure that you're using gloves when you're handling your chromatography paper. You want to be careful to avoid any type of contamination. Be careful to use a clean toothpick for each sample because you don't want to cross-contaminate your dyes. Once you've spotted your dyes, you need to label them. Here we're going to use a pencil to label each lane of our chromatogram. Remember that you want to avoid using ink because ink contains dyes that can also smear when you're developing your chromatogram. Once you've spotted and labeled your chromatogram, Fold out the edges so that the paper can stand freely. We're now ready to develop our chromatogram. First, we're going to add about 30 to 40 milliliters of our developing solution to our developing chamber. This contains about 5% acetic acid, or vinegar, and 5% sodium chloride. Next, carefully add your chromatogram to the solution, making sure that the developing solution is below your baseline. Replace the lid on the developing chamber to limit the evaporation of the solvent and slowly wait for the solvent to creep up your chromatography paper due to capillary action. Once the solvent front is within about two centimeters of the top of your chromatography paper, you want to remove your chromatogram from the developing chamber. Then you want to mark the solvent front before the solvent completely dries. Now we're gonna repeat this process for our second set of five samples, which will be our three food coloring samples and two unknowns. To do this, prepare another piece of chromatography paper marking the baselines as well as folding marks, and then fold your chromatography paper before you begin to spot it. Once again, lightly mark five tick marks on your baseline where you will be applying your dyes. Carefully spot your baseline, making sure that you're using clean toothpicks again for each dye sample. Again, make sure that you're applying the appropriate amount of dye to each spot. Remember that you don't want too large of a spot but you also want to make sure that you get enough dye so that you get good results. When you're done spotting your chromatography paper, remember to label each lane of your chromatogram in the same order in which you applied the dyes. Now you're ready to develop your second chromatogram. It's not necessary to start with a clean developing chamber and new developing solution. You can reuse the same developing chamber and solution that you used for part A. Once your chamber is ready, place your chromatogram in the developing chamber, making sure that your developing solution is below the baseline. 
Replace the lid on the developing chamber to reduce the amount of solvent that evaporates during the developing process. Wait until the solution rises to within 2 centimeters of the top of the chromatography paper. If the solvent reaches the top of your chromatography paper, it may be necessary to redo your chromatogram. Now remove your chromatogram from the developing chamber and make sure to mark the solvent front before the solvent dries. Let the chromatogram fully dry on a paper towel. To analyze our dry chromatogram, we're first going to go through and mark each spot. We're going to do this by outlining the spot with a pencil, and then coming back through and marking roughly the center of each spot so that we can measure them in a later step. Here's an example of what a fully marked chromatogram will look like. In this case, because we've used pure dye samples, there should only be one spot per lane on your chromatogram. Next, we're going to go through the chromatogram lane by lane, measuring the distance from the baseline to the center of each spot, and the distance from the baseline to the solvent front. We want to record each of these distances on our data sheet for each spot. We again repeat this process for each spot on our chromatogram, measuring the distance from the baseline to the spot, and from the baseline to the solvent front. Remember that the distance from the baseline to the solvent front could change as we go across our chromatogram, especially if the solvent front is not uniformly high across our chromatography paper. Make sure to record all values on your data sheet to two decimal places, where the last digit is estimated between the markings. Once you've completed this process for your first chromatogram with your five dye standards, you're going to repeat the process for your second chromatogram with the five dye mixtures. Unlike the pure dye standards, the mixtures may contain two or even three different substances and may have multiple spots per lane. Be on the lookout for faint spots, particularly with the color yellow. Once you've outlined your spots, go back through and mark the center of each spot before measuring. This is what a completed chromatogram with mixtures might look like. Once you've marked your chromatogram, remember to measure the distance from the baseline to the center of each spot, and there may be multiple spots per lane, and also from the baseline to the solvent front for each lane. Record this in your data sheet for each of the substances on your second chromatogram. Once you've measured the spot and solvent front distances for each lane on your chromatogram, you need to calculate the retention factor. The retention factor is the spot distance divided by the solvent front distance for each spot on your chromatogram. Once you've calculated retention factors for each spot on both chromatograms, you can compare the retention factors for each spot in your mixtures to the retention factors of those of your pure dye standards to determine the identities of the dyes present in each of your mixtures.